Good afternoon again. Hope we are all feeling a little bit more refreshed after this, the snacks and another infusion of the coffee. Very important this time of day, especially after the holiday weekend you all just had recently. Uh, we're going to move to our third and final session now, curtailing illicit flows, global, regional, and domestic policy options. We will have our presenters talk about what Brazil could be doing should the next government wish to tackle this more forcefully, which we hope this project and you all will encourage them to do. Leonardo Barlamacqui, one of our panelists from the previous session, will be moderating this. And he is joined by uh, Raymond Baker, the president of Global Financial Integrity, who will talk about some of the general policy options and will also be able to talk about what the US government has been doing on this issue and Matt Woods, the Deputy Consul General and Head of UK Trade and Investment with the British Consulate General here in Rio de Janeiro. So I will turn it over to Leonardo. Okay, uh, thank you very much for staying till now. Uh, has been a full day of discussions. And in a way, I think that this session has already started in a previous one, right? I think this is more or less gonna be, we like it or not, some kind of follow-up of the previous one, which already had the global and the domestic uh, levels intertwine a lot. And I think that this this is the way the conversation should, should really go. So uh, our distinguished panelists here are, well, Dr. Raymond Baker, which obviously at that point doesn't need any further introduction. We already know <laughs> uh, not all that he 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 did or or all that he has to offer us if we were really serious about reading the whole bio, but we certainly know Raymond uh, quite well at this point for for this workshop. Uh, and just reminding you that the Raymond is the, the president and the, the the first, I won't, won't even say the biggest, maybe I, I, wish I, I could, but I would say is the first force, first real force behind the whole initiative for global financial integrity. I can I can't tell that from from the beginnings, right from from two thousand and six when we were discussing uh the idea of of, of doing those reports uh, at the Ford Foundation in in New York, and it was a a, a, a great great ple privilege and, and pleasure to to have been able to to fund them. And we also have Dr. Matt Matt Woods, which at present is Deputy Consul General uh, in UK, right? Uh, and it's here, I think, for about a year. That has been here, and he previously uh, were. Er, based in Ethiopia and also had roles previously to that in London. And before that, it was before his engagement with the foreign office, he also worked in the private sector and a OECD and also uh, with the French civil service, right? Is that correct? Okay, so we have two very uh, distinguished panelists and I'm very much uh, willing to participate in that at that time there and not here, which is kind of comfortable. Okay, uh, without further ado, I think Raymond, you come first, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Leonardo. And let me um, start off with another story. <laughs> um, the book that I wrote was entitled Capitalism's Achilles Heel, and it was subtitled Dirty Money. In 2006, when we formed Global Financial Integrity, my colleague Tom Cardamone and I sat down and we said to ourselves, we can't use the term dirty money. <laughs> this, this makes people nervous and upset and uh, uh, is, you know, we've got to figure out something that, that uh, is better than that. So, you know, we thought about illegal capital flight, and we thought about other uh, terminologies and so forth, but we finally zeroed in on illicit financial flows. It's exactly the same thing. 
but it sounds much more sophisticated, and much, you know, much more saleable in the global uh, uh, agenda. So um, at the time that we zeroed in on those words, illicit financial flows, that concept was not in the, uh, um, uh, the political uh, lexicon. It, that vocabulary was not used uh, uh, in talking about this subject matter. And I'm pointing this out to you because I think it's, it's true to say that vocabulary influences acceptability. And we have succeeded in getting the concept illicit financial flows onto the global uh, economy agenda. Those three words are used by the World Bank, the IMF, UN, OECD, uh, um, uh, national governments, uh, regional organizations, and so forth. We've gotten those words uh, into the vocabulary. And it's very much uh, the support and the encouragement and the funding of Norway and the Ford Foundation that have accounted for that. Yes, we and others have worked to get this agenda on the table, but you too, organizations in particular, government and foundation uh, are the reason why uh, these words are now used, accepted in, uh, in the vocabulary. Okay, we've gotten the concept, illicit financial flows, into global thinking, into the political economy agenda. Um, have we made any progress in uh, trying to curtail this uh, phenomenon? And I use the word curtail because I do want to be clear that that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about ending this phenomenon. We're not going to end it. Uh, but, but, but we can substantially curtail it, we think, with some fairly straightforward measures. And we've made some progress in that direction, as I will illustrate as we go uh, through this. There are two things in particular that we seek to do, and that is to... Um, uh, have much greater transparency in the financial system, the domestic, regional, and international financial systems. We advocate transparency. Stop the secrecy. Stop the hidden uh, movements of, of uh, these funds. Transparency is the agenda that we work uh, on. Now, another part of that involves greater cooperation between governments in shutting down the channels through which illicit money uh, flows. And Leonardo um, and Olaf have both talked about tax havens. This is, uh, this is a big part of it. Um, but I'd like to go on and talk about, um, uh, with those two policy measures, uh, what are the teeth? What, we need to put teeth into these concepts. And what can we do to accomplish that? Um, first of all, we advocate um, transparency of company ownership. It is ridiculous to do business with an entity where you do not know with whom you are doing business. This is unacceptable. Having said it, more, Ill more disguised companies exist in the United States than in any other country. Uh, and this is because we allow corporations to be formed at the state level and as you mentioned, Delaware, there's been a race to the bottom by all of the other states in the United States to be equally open to um, anonymous uh, corporations, as is Delaware, to the point that we now have millions. Corporations are formed in the United States at the state level. Not at, there's no such thing as a national uh, corporation. And so the states have been racing to the bottom to make it easier and easier to establish such entities. So we literally have millions and millions of entities in the United States where no one knows who are the natural persons owning those accounts except the company formation agent, and he may not on occasions know if he's acting on behalf of a foreign tax haven uh, uh, entity, and he doesn't have to report that in the documents that he files with the state authorities. So we've had uh, 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 prosecutors uh, tell us that they have frequently run into a roadblock that they cannot get past when they're trying to trace drug money or corrupt money or other uh, illicit money. They cannot find out. 
who's the natural person who's owning accounts. Step one, know with whom you are dealing. There is no argument in favor of not knowing with whom uh, you are dealing. Second thing that we advocate um, is automatic exchange of financial information across borders. We've talked about this uh, a little bit. Um, this is moving. Uh, the G20 is encouraging this. The OECD is encouraging this. We're making substantial strides towards the automatic exchange of information across borders. It's the word automatic that's important here. <clears throat> For a long time, we've had a process whereby one country can request information from another country, and then that other country can consider whether or not it wants to give the, uh, the requesting country that information and may take three years to do it, uh, by which time the uh, information is of little value. Uh, we're now talking about a process of automatic exchange of tax uh, and, and financial information across borders. Uh, this has existed between the United States and Canada in fairly good form for a good many years. For 25 years, Mexico requested to have the same thing between Mexico and the United States as existed between the United States and Canada, and only recently have we implemented that, giving Mexico automatic exchange of uh, information. Within the European Union, there's a good bit of automatic exchange of information. The savings tax directive um, means that uh, uh, countries will report to the other country earnings on bank accounts uh, by the foreign citizens in that country, so that that information flows automatically. This is beginning to, uh, uh, to work, and indeed, I think this uh, will go global uh, fairly soon. It was mentioned this morning that uh, I've had the pleasure of serving with Tabo and Becky on the high-level panel on illicit financial flows out of, uh, out of Africa. We've gone to a number of countries that have said to us, we don't have the capacity to deal with this automatic exchange of information. And they've said, let us come into this process in five years or seven years or something like that. And uh, President Mbeki has argued the opposite. He has said, that's not what you say. You say you're ready to work with this immediately. You may not be able to deal with 100% of the information uh, that you receive or that you're asked to give, but get started. Get into this agenda from the beginning. I think this is uh, uh, beginning uh, to move. And then the third thing that we um, recommend is stronger efforts to curtail the misinvoicing of trade. Throughout this day, you've heard us say that it is the misinvoicing of trade that moves more illicit money across borders than any other mechanism. Indeed, it moves more than all other mechanisms combined. This is, I don't know if this translates into Portuguese or not, but this is where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> this, is, this is where uh, this, is, this is where th this issue really becomes critical, is in trying to figure out how, um, how do you uh, make uh, trade misinvoicing uh, reduced, how do you make it more transparent and more, um, uh, uh, more able to be watched by uh, developing countries. There are a number of steps that can be taken in that direction. Um, legislation, uh, declarative statements, uh, real-time access to pricing data, um, and audit verification. I will discuss uh, each of these in a little bit more detail. First of all, legislation. We recommend to every country that we deal with that you have legislation that says it is illegal to intentionally misprice trade uh, for the purpose of manipulating VAT taxes, customs duties, income taxes, excise taxes, or any other form of revenue that may accrue to the government. Pass a law that says it's illegal to do that. 
first of all, get the law on the books that says it's illegal for you to do that, even if you're doing it in your head office uh, uh, far away. If you're using the trade mechanism to manipulate VAT taxes, customs duties, et cetera, uh, that is against the law, against the law in this case of Brazil. Then, going on from there, we recommend that corporations be required to sign a declarative statement saying that they have abided by that point. I don't like reading slides, but in this case, I'm going to read this one uh, to you. In relation to the, this is a statement that would appear on the annual accounts of the corporation would, and would be signed by the chief executive officer of the corporation. In relation to the importation or exportation of goods or in relation to the importation or exportation or utilization of services or intangibles, there has been no misstatement of price, quantity, quality, volume, or other substantive term of invoice, one, for the purpose of manipulating customs duties, VAT taxes, income taxes, excise taxes, or any other form of revenues collected by or to be collected by the government, or two, for the purpose of evading or violating banking, capital, or foreign exchange controls or anti-money laundering statutes or terrorist financing provisions. Sign it. Sign it that you have abided by that. Is it a perfect solution? No, we're not talking about perfect solutions. We're talking about curtailing this money. There are not a whole lot of corporations that will intentionally manipulate the prices of their imports and exports and then require a signature that says they've done no such thing. And part of the reason is because at some stage, that corporation will have an employee who departs, either willingly or unwillingly, and says, boy, am I glad to be out of there. You can't imagine what I had to do while I was working in that uh, company. I had to manipulate these prices all the time. It's going to be a very brave CEO of a corporation that says, I'm going to, I'm going to sign this at the same time that I'm violating this provision over and over and over again. Sign it. Not perfect, it's a step in the direction of curtailing what we're talking about. Now, there is a, another step that is very important and that is giving developing and uh, emerging market countries access to pricing data in real time. I'll give you an example. The United States publishes its trade data on imports and exports according to 25,000 categories called the harmonized system, the harmonized system of identifying uh, goods that move across borders. Um, it is uh, accessible uh, online. We are advocating and are working with developing countries to access that information online. So when you see um, a, a product coming through, identified by a harmonized code, uh, you can look at comparable prices in the United States, and indeed additional such information is available in the UK and Germany and some other European countries, and you can see does this roughly conform to world market norms? And if it doesn't, you have a risk management tool capable of identifying those transactions that should have extra scrutiny. Again, not a perfect tool, but it's a valuable tool, knowing what is the world market price for items in this uh, category. Um, that kind of data is becoming increasingly available and we work to make it increasingly available to the customs departments of uh, developing countries. Another step that we recommend is auditors looking at uh, trades, transactions that have been misinvoiced when they audit the books. 
not trying to make policemen out of auditors, but let me give you an example of what auditors see all the time. Uh, an auditor can look at the same item being imported or exported um, once a month, every month, for 11 months of the year. And then he can see that in the 12th month of the year, the price of that item was substantially varied, up or down, as uh, the case may be. And then the first month of the succeeding year, it went back to the original price. The manipulation was done in the last month of the year for the purpose of manipulating uh, uh, the income taxes uh, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the company. Auditors can look at those kinds of transactions every day, and they are under no obligation to report it. We think they should be under obligation to report it. We're not asking them to review every trade transaction. We're asking you to report what you see when you see it. That would be a valuable addition to this business of, of trying to curtail uh, the misinvoicing of, uh, of trade. What we're talking about in this entire framework of uh, addressing illicit financial flows is political will. You've perhaps heard the expression concerning real estate, it's location, location, location. In this case, it's political will, political will, political will. Nothing that I have outlined here this afternoon is rocket science. Nothing is that difficult to do. It's fairly straightforward and can be implemented. The break that people have to make in their thinking is we're not trying to stop it altogether. We're not trying to provide the perfect law that can stand up in a court against uh, somebody that has been doing the wrong thing. We are trying to do on a day-to-day -day basis the curtailment of this phenomenon. That's where we're coming from. Curtail this. And as I said this morning, leave the money in the emerging market and developing economies. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Matt. Uh, I feel like I'm at uh, two main disadvantages uh, just now. Actually, I'll put three. Uh, the first one being, I thought it was an absolutely excellent uh, speech, so thank you very much for that, really uh, powerful. Uh, the second disadvantage is speaking last at a conference. And the third disadvantage, uh, which is now quite familiar, but uh, never very comfortable, is talking about an issue on which I don't know an enormous amount. It's a room full of people who do know an enormous amount about it. Um, so apologies in advance uh, for that. I wonder if I a boa. É que vocês não têm que sofrer o meu português, que eu vou falar em inglês. Então, vocês desculpem por isso também. Bom, so, uh, well, why, am I, why am I talking today and what am I going to tell you? Um, uh, happily, I want to pick up on a few of the themes which uh, Raymond spoke about just now. And I think I'll start with the last one, about political will. Um, and this is something which, uh, which my government and my Prime Minister, David Cameron, uh, feels extraordinarily strongly about, um, personally. And it's an agenda which he has been trying to drive both domestically and internationally uh, for some years, and perhaps most notably uh, since the uh, G8 Lochan summit uh, last year. And I think if I try and put this uh, topic into context, it really falls into his sort of three T's agenda. I'm glad I'm not speaking Portuguese because it's not three T's in Portuguese. Uh, the first one is tax, the second one trade, and the third one transparency. In fact, I'll take them in, in the other order. Um, and I very much like the um, uh, subtitle here about the importance of this issue for improving uh, both national and international uh, prosperity, something very uh, dear to David Cameron's heart, given that when he took over as uh, Prime Minister in the UK, we were basically bankrupt, uh, and uh, he spent the last few years trying to pull us out of it. Uh, so, on uh, transparency... I think, again, there are two real sides to this. I gather you've been speaking quite a lot about enforcement, and I'll come to that um, in a minute. There is, of course, a positive side uh, to transparency about making uh, governments more accountable to their citizens by not just making information uh, available, but also accessible. 
And this is something, if I try and connect to Brazil a little bit, this is something that the UK has been working very much with Brazil on, uh, as partly as co-founders of the Open Government uh, uh, Partnership, which is a multilateral initiative which tries to do exactly that. And actually, it's interesting to see uh, who's left. I'm sorry, the chap there, Rogério from the FGV, who are doing some great work on the transparency of uh, budgeting in Brazil, looking at the transfers between the federal and the state level, um, and what that money gets spent on, how effectively it gets spent. It's really interesting stuff. I recommend you all to look at it. The uh, website is the DAP, the Department for Analysis of Public Policy of FGV. Um, so under, uh, as part of our kind of uh, cooperation with Brazil on this agenda, we've been working on freedom of information, uh, on the Anti-Bribery Act, both of which in Brazil model on, on UK legislation. The Brazilian Freedom of Information Act has been tremendously successful. 87,000 requested information that hadn't happened before, being made by citizens and being responded to uh, in 95% of cases within 11 days. I mention this because there is, I wanted to kind of underline this positive side to, uh, to transparency also. Um, on the more kind of enforcement side, uh, I couldn't agree more about the importance of knowing who you deal with. Or oh, in me, my prime minister couldn't agree more with the importance of knowing who you deal with. And that's why uh, our government has pushed forward this initiative on beneficial ownership. So it no longer being possible uh, for somebody to act in, in the way that you have described in your, in your last talk. Um, about it being now in the UK, we will have a public register of every, of every company, we have that already, but everyone within that company who has either uh, more than 25% of shares of voting rights or any other power over that company. Um, so when the Prime Minister initially, originally committed to this uh, last year at the Lockerhand Summit, he didn't commit to it being public. He just said we should collect this data and we should know it as a government. And after a public consultation, he's now decided, no, we should actually make this absolutely public. Um, and uh, so that's, I think, a really, a really positive development. I'd echo, echo what you said. I think the second positive development, which is uh, underway rather than concluded, is uh, you mentioned tax havens. Unfortunately, uh, some of these tax havens are British uh, overseas territories or dependent territories. Yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, the Prime Minister has written an open letter to all of those territories, asking them to please join the initiative, um, to consult and to uh, implement this public register of official ownership of, of companies. Um, I think it's fair to say that progress has been patchy uh, since then, but at least it's on the table. And I think uh, with this kind of issue, issue, it's about getting on the table. And that's why the work that, uh, that you and other uh, organizations do is, is quite so important, that bringing to bear the, the, the pressure on governments to be better. Um, uh, Good. I'm going to pass to tax um, and pick up on something else which, uh, which Raymond uh, mentioned just now. Um, in fact, two things. Um, one, yes, uh, so domestically we believe that having a stable tax base uh, and having in fact the largest number of double taxation agreements of any other uh, country in the world makes us an attractive country to do business with. Now, we don't have one with Brazil. Uh, that is an entire other seminar, which I'm not going to get into, uh, but we'd, we'd love to have one. Um, and we see kind of tax as an issue, as so fundamental, um, including to the developing world, uh, that we spend some 20 million pounds a year on uh, tax capacity uh, programs. I'm sure USID spends a, a pretty significant amount as well. And I was very interested in what you were saying about, uh, about Africa, having been in, in Ethiopia and worked a lot in Somalia, Tanzania, Uganda, uh, you know, uh, uh, Kenya, enormous amounts of, uh, uh, of illicit uh, financial flows and incredibly difficult to get a handle on. There we looked at more from the financial, uh, uh, from terrorist funding side, but uh, clearly, clearly relevant as well, uh, as well here. Um, for example, we are working, so if I bring this back to Brazil, we're working with the Conseil de Federal uh, on how to introduce a uh, authorized supplier process. Um, so you can have pre-clearance for goods before they leave at the port of origin. So that's all about uh, trying to get a better handle on, uh, on what, you're, uh, what you're able to tax and, and how you do that. Um, and uh, I think the, the most important thing to highlight is on the automatic exchange of information as you, as you picked out. Um, this is, uh, this is something else that the uh, UK happily is, is out in front on. So we are officially an early adopter, whatever that means. Uh, so we will put it into place by 2017. Brazil is also a relatively early adopter. They've committed to doing it in 2018. And I agree that the key is absolutely to make it automated, make it automatic. Um, I'll turn at the end to our aims or our hopes for the G20 conference in Brisbane. Uh, but that is uh, absolutely, absolutely one of them. 
um, and more specifically to Brazil, uh, when uh, David Cameron was here in 2012, he did sign a bilateral agreement with Brazil, um, which hopefully means we won't, we won't, and Brazil won't have to wait 25 years uh, for a request to come through. Uh, finally, on trade, I mean, I guess trade, it's increased trade, I mean, we believe very strongly it's better for everybody. It increases the size of the cake. Um, fine. Uh, but in order to have really effective trade between nations, you've got to have some confidence, uh, both on the transparency side and on the tax side, which is why I think it's impossible to divorce the domestic from the international context. I was interested in how you started, started your talk. Um, and I'm not surprised to hear that you've been dotting around between the two over the last over the last couple of days, I think it's impossible to separate them. And actually, I think it helps to build political will in any country um, if it is part of an, an international effort. And if that international effort is not just between governments, but it also includes civil society and all the pressure that that can bring to bear. Um, so uh, finally, turning to what is next for us, well, um, I think domestically we still have some work to do in uh, in uh, in trying to add some pressure onto the overseas uh, territories and dependencies, and encouraging them uh, to, uh, uh, to to be more to be more transparent to adopt the beneficial ownership initiative. I'm not sure. I don't think you've talked about it today. Another thing we're we're focusing on is EITI, the Extractives Industry Transparency Initiative. Another thing we are uh, keen on. Uh, Brazil um, feels rightly that it has very strong domestic. Uh, transparency requirements on mining, uh, oil and gas exploration, and so on. So it doesn't uh, necessarily at this point uh, see the value in a see enough value in joining a multilateral effort. But we'd love to see that uh, change. Um, but looking forward to Brisbane and the and the G20. What are our objectives? They're going to be that we would like more countries to sign up to EITI. Absolutely. Um, we would like uh, to see more countries uh, sign up to the, the beneficial ownership initiative. Um, on the tax side, we absolutely want more countries signing up to the automatic exchange of information. And on the trade side, again, I don't think you've uh, perhaps talked about it too much, but strong support to the WTO and the Bali package and the trade facilitation agreement. So that's what we're going to be going into Brisbane hoping for, and I'll be very open with you about that, um, because at the end of the day, that feels, that feels appropriate. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today, and I'll hand you back over to Leonel. Okay, so thank you very much for all the presentations. I think they were very interesting and useful because uh, they touched on concrete, concrete uh, recommendations and concrete measures that could be could be in a way. And well, I think Raymond that you you finished the same way I did in the sense that. Uh, stressing or underlining the question of political will, right? Uh, I'm not sure if we have a different approach to that political will in the sense that I'm perhaps more skeptical about its existence than you are. But anyway, I think we totally agree on the fact that without the political will, uh, it's very, very little can be done. Uh, so, I, I, but in your case, let me just throw <coughs> a couple of questions here just to warm up for the discussion with our colleagues in the room here. Uh, the first question that I that I want to raise to you is something that you mentioned not now. You mentioned in your in your opening. No, in in your your first. Uh, your first participation, first pa panel, uh, which is the fact that services are out, right? And at the same time, I think you also added to that, and I think we, we all know the services are becoming more and more and more the bulk of uh, international trade and not tangibles. And so looking forward, my question is, well, if we stick with trade alone, we're going to be missing a bigger chunk of like trade in terms of like tangibles and other tangibles. So, why services are out, and what has to be done 
in order to get them in so that you can you can have a, a more accurate uh, measure and, and picture of what's exactly happening. And the second question um, is more of a maybe a, a, a detail on, on the recommendations that, that you just laid out. Now one is like the price checking and the other the auditing, right? Obviously, I think those things will, well, they occur by the millions, right? Millions of transactions. So one could raise the point, how can you monitor millions and millions and millions of transactions uh, if they're done like on a daily basis, etc. But then there is where my question uh, enters. Could this be done at least initially by some sort of algorithm or algorithms that would like run like for running to millions and millions of transactions and when there was a discrepancy or some sort of difference, whatever, some signal will pop up and then someone could be directed to verify that. If this could be done or if it's already in the works, that would be for a change a kind of financial innovation that would work work for good. Could be not not a financial weapon of mass destruction, but something different from that. So I just wanna I wanna hear from you on on that. So if this is already going on, or is there something uh, being thought about that? And uh, in your case, uh, Matt, let me also uh, throw one question that will be provocative because I think the whole idea of the, of the conversation and the debate is to try to provoke some, some reactions, is that you rightly said that, well, you're very much in agreement with uh, all the recommendations that Raymond laid out. Uh, but I think there is a point that I think has at least to be raised, which is the fact that we all know London is the financial capital <coughs> of Europe, is very much aware of that, it's proud about that, and of course, on the sort of pragma pragmatic side, very similarly to what Wall Street is to New York, the city of London <laughs> generates the bulk of the tax revenues that for, for London, right? So your mayor there uh, is always mentioning that. So he's very happy to have them there. And the point is that that means a lot of political muscle from the side of the financial industry, which, you correct me if I'm wrong, but which generally is not very much on the side of transparency, much the country they are more and more, no, not more and more, they are generally speaking on the side of opaqueness. So if you agree with that or I don't know, even you, if you don't agree with that, I would like to hear from you uh, on this sort of transparency versus the political muscle from the, from the British financial industry. Uh, where does the political will to change those things, where does this stand right now in the UK? It's just to start the conversation. So. Okay. You really know how to put your finger on the yeah. <laughs> on the issues. Um, services uh, and intangibles. Um, I think it's about 27 26, 27 percent of global trade at the present time is services and intangibles, and it may be uh, much higher than that because we don't, there's a lot of aspects of this that we don't know anything about. What to do? The prevailing global norm is called the arm's length principle. That is that whether you are related parties or you are unrelated parties in an import-export transaction, 
you should conduct business between yourselves as uh, at arm's length, as though you are not related. This is the standard. Um, and we are able to look at data and see um, where that operates satisfactorily uh, in connection with merchandise. We're not able to do that in connection with services because there's no data collected. There's very little data collected on services. So what to do uh, with services? What we have recommended to some governments, I'll take uh, uh, India as an example. We have recommended a requirement for most favored nation status in the pricing of services. Once again, signage. Uh, multinational corporations sign a statement that you have given to us most favorable nation status uh, in the pricing of services and intangibles charged to companies operating uh, in our country so that um, licenses and royalties and software and management contracts and so forth have to be priced uh, or you were requiring that they be priced at the most favorable level that you're giving to any other uh, uh, company, uh, country. Um, the availability of comparable pricing data to check that is not, uh, is not there. So how do you get comparable data? If you have a doubt that you are being given most favored nation status. The country can call for documentation on the prices at which you charged selected other countries. Prove it. Prove that the number you've given us is comparable to the best prices that you've given to these other uh, countries. There's a lot of documentation there, and it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, it'd probably be years before we ever get to the point that we do something like this. But again, my point is, it's not rocket science. It is something that can be done with um, a political will to get there. Services, our approach is require most favorable nation uh, status. Price checking, uh, the second question that you've had, how do you, uh, how do you deal with this? This again is, is a little bit complicated. When a ship is coming into a harbor, and is uh, about to offload its cargo. That ship is required to send ahead details of the bills of lading that are on the ship to be offloaded. The bill of lading does not include the price. The bill of lading simply says, this is the specifications of what's going to be offloaded in each of these uh, uh, transactions. The invoice data is not there. It is not required to be sent because it's not collected. Bills of lading data um, is collected. Invoice data is not. So what you have to do is you have to figure out where are you most vulnerable for uh, mispricing, and you check that. So when we do work, we work with countries to figure out which commodities are most likely to be misinvoiced, and which countries are most likely to participate in that misinvoicing. So we can then direct a, uh, a developing country or transitional uh, uh, economy or emerging market country to, uh, to pay particular attention to those things that we've identified as most vulnerable. Again, it's not perfect but it gives you a way of checking those things that, uh, that are most likely uh, uh, to be mispriced. Ideally, and I suppose this may take 50 years to do, we would like to see ships send ahead the selection of their invoices uh, so that you've got that kind of data. But the global trading system is not in that position at the, uh, at the present time. So what you do is you use price checking um, to apply to those areas that you think where you think you are most vulnerable to misplaced, missing. Okay. Carol. Sure. 
Good. Well, yes, it was a good question. I'll give you a general rather than a specific answer. Um, I think I'd probably recast your question as uh, um, how can we ensure that the strength of the regulator uh, uh, wins against the strength of financial innovation? And I think that's the story of what's happened over the last mm, decade or more than that. Um, you asked about uh, uh, how we would muster the political will in order to kind of get the balance right on that. I think there's probably two answers. Um, the first is and there's, there's some irony in the fact that it was a supposedly left uh, uh, wing government, or traditionally left wing government, which presided over an era of deregulation, yeah. and now a predominantly right wing go okay, coalition government, but predominantly right wing government, which is presiding over an era of, an era of tighter regulation. Um, uh, there we go. Uh, since I think the, the best uh, uh, thing that could have happened to strengthen the regulator's hand in a perverse way was the crash and the problems. Um, so I think sometimes it takes a shock like that. Perhaps it would have been better to have had a slightly less significant shock uh, to uh, really make uh, not just the government, but um, the public, um, civil society, um, uh, realize that there has to be a stronger balance and tighter regulation and public acceptance of that. I think that's really important when you talk about where political will comes from. I think that's a big part of it. What do the public want? Well, they want jobs, they want economic growth. Yes. Um, how do they get there? Well, okay, the details are the details. Um, they're not going to get into a huge amount of that. So in a way, the crash brought the issue into public consciousness in a way that it wasn't, wasn't there before. So I do think that there is now political will, and that comes from public legitimacy, um, of recognizing the need to take a tighter uh, uh, approach to regulation. And there are various technical uh, ways that that's happening, and I'm afraid I'm not going to speak to them because I don't know them. I think there might be the Financial Supervisory Board, FSB, that rings a bell. I'm looking around the room because someone in the room probably knows more about it than I do. Okay, thank you. So now I think it's uh, your time. So uh, questions, observations, uh, whatever you want. Just raise your hand. We'll have mics around, and please uh, say your your name and your affiliation. Hi, uh, Rogério uh, Sobreiro from Minds and Getúlio Vargas Foundation (FGV). Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to co-host this uh, uh, event, uh, Raymond. And uh, unfortunately, I won't be able uh, to make it in the morning. And uh, at least I'm here during the afternoon and uh, to take advantage of those uh, uh, clarifying and enlightening presentations of yours. And uh, uh, I think that uh, the case of illicit financial flows uh, in general is very important. In the case of Brazil, it's much more important. And I, 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 I managed to read the report you released yesterday, and it astonished me a lot, the amount of uh, illicit financial flows from Brazil during the period analyzed. It's uh, huge, really, really huge. And uh, on this, uh, uh, in based on your presentation uh, 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 earlier, uh, I have a, uh, one question that crossed my mind, which is, uh, uh, you, you mentioned uh, two things that, for me, are very important in order to curtail uh, illicit financial flows, not only in Brazil, but uh, uh, <coughs> elsewhere, which is, uh, the first one is uh, transparency. You mentioned transparency is an important uh, uh, thing to be pursued in order to curtail illicit financial flows, and the other one, uh, is uh, the uh, uh, political will. And uh, uh, I, I've, I've, I was thinking about uh, uh, how transparency can be connected to uh, uh, political will. Let me clarify my point. Uh, uh, my transparency, and that this is one thing that I've been working with uh, at FGV, uh, 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 we are very used to to uh, to think that uh, uh, put information available is the same thing as put information transparent. Uh, and uh, one thing that we've learned from our experience is that 
uh, uh, sometimes these are not the same thing. And the, to, to make information transparent is to make them uh, intelli intelligible, understandable for you know the vast majority of people, because uh, by making those information tele intelligible to the vast majority of people, you know uh, the so to speak or generally speaking uh, political participation of the society will help to entice so to speak a political will. And uh, I, I would like to hear you on this uh, interconnectedness between availability, transparency, and political will. Uh, so my, my point is, uh, can we, uh, and the institutions like yours, institutions like mines, institutions like FGV, I see them very important uh, 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 institutions that will you know, put some pressure on making those type of information more transparent, not only available, but transparent, in order to entice society's participation, uh, you know, to curtail those flows, because those flows, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 damage a lot uh, 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 the economy. Uh, so uh, I would like to hear you on this, if you, if you think uh, that uh, uh, with more transparency uh, 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 and uh, uh, by means of uh, making information more transparent, we, 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 we will eventually be able to invite society to this important debate. Thank you. Uh, maybe we should go back to the first again. Paulo, please. Uh, I think that's uh, that's one point that uh, Bernardo said before. That, see, political will, uh, it's something that we we say that we don't want to face the the political reality, the 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 the, the, um, the type of coalitions that creates the governments. So. Uh, it's difficult to see this kind of change happening in, for example, after something like Citizens United. And um, taking the, 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 the con character in Angels in America, there is something called clout. Who has clout to, to create this re-regulation? So that, 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 that's one thing that w we must start to look. Who is, uh, in whose, uh, whose interest the re-regulation is happening? Uh, that's one, uh, I think that should be one kind of research because uh, political will itself won't resolve the, 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 the kind of coalition we have in this interest. Yeah. And coalition is not, just politics, but the, the the people that have the money. Uh, and this there's a problem in United Kingdom that the long down real estate markets uh, became some kind of uh, way to um, to save money without risks of, uh, for example, like Cyprus that the the money disappear for people from China, Russia. So uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, at the same time that uh, you make a discourse of, oh, we are trying to be transparent, blah, blah, blah. At the same time, the, there's this uh, exuberance of the London real estate market. Not the, the real estate market in the UK, but specifically London. And uh, at the same time, that uh, I don't know who could make some pressure against Cayman Islands, Virgin Islands. Virgin Islands, we have a, a, a history with the Virgin Islands because the, the most famous cor corrupt politician in Brazil had a process in Virgin Islands. <coughs> so we know a lot of Virgin Islands. And um, see, I, I don't know who could pressure Virgin Islands, perhaps, the, the, the one that has some kind of authority over there 
is the United Kingdom. The pressure should come from the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And not just, oh, you should do this. I believe that maybe there could be some uh, more pressure that could be done, but the thing is, uh, we don't see this. So it's sometimes it looks m like uh, you're doing some lip service to transparency, but at the same time, the, the, the crucial thing that, for example, Switzerland is trying to deal because of the pressure of Germany and the pressure of uh, United States, you're not dealing with, and this thing is tax evasion and tax sheltering and dirty money. Uh, if you could just add a couple of points to, to what he said, because I think uh, he raised something that I think will get you into a little bit more complex uh, environment to 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 respond to him uh, the first one is that and it's a question to you related to to paulus is that you just said okay uh, we had the shock we had the crisis so now uh, people are much more aware of the problems and they could help a lot in terms of building those this political will without which we cannot think in terms of real reforms. On the other hand, my Paul just said, it's also a big chunk of reality, meaning that uh, the city claims and advertises itself as, okay, we're the, we're the financial capital, maybe, well, we're the financial capital of Europe, and well, really, we're aiming at being the financial capital of the world, which means, we have to please the Russians, the Chinese, and all the other foreigners, corporations, etc., with enough money to park it here so that they feel comfortable uh, doing business in our financial arena. And again, this creates, I think, a tension, a big one, in between those interests there some way or the other has to be, they have to be pleased. Uh, and the people down there, which the ones who want jobs, development, etc. So they're completely different uh, agendas and completely different menus, right? And just to finish up in terms of remembering some, not remembering, it's just it's happening as we speak. Uh, okay, we had the chalk, we had financial, a lot of financial uh, reform talks, and some of them were even quite aggressive. Remember the German minister, former German minister of finance, Sir Mervyn King. It was, it was a very interesting moment on that. It passed. It's not there anymore. What concretely happened in the U.S. was Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank was already passed still there, is being washed out a lot thanks to the interests and the power of the financial industry in the U.S. And now it has, what, 800 pages with, I don't know, some thousand other pages in, term, in, in, in order to clarify those 800 pages. So with political will, with... Uh, I don't know, uh, Elizabeth Warren with uh, Senator Dodd, Senator Frank, Occupy Wall Street, a lot happened there in terms of civil society, in terms of movement, etc. And what we're seeing right now is that Dodd-Frank is not that promising after it already passed. So that just I wanted to, to, to add to Paulo's uh, reflection. Okay. You, let's let's re reverse the order, then you, you go first, he goes, yeah, go, go okay. first. Well, let me start at the end. I mean, I think, I don't know very much about uh, the US political system, but I do know that they're struggling to pass any legislation whatsoever. Um, so I don't know whether this amendment's got caught up in that, but it seems I would be wary of conflating the two, I think. Um, and in the UK, we don't have such a 
uh, currently deadlocked system of legislation and executive. Um, so perhaps uh, one can have more hope in the UK. I don't know. I don't know. Um, coming to uh, uh, Paolo, your your questions. Yeah, I didn't mention the British Virgin Islands and the Cayman Islands by name, uh, but I did say British dependent territories and overseas <laughs> territories, which are, by which I meant uh, particularly those two, but also Jersey, uh, while we're at it, also Bermuda. You know, there are quite a few. Um, so, yeah, you're right. This is a problem. Um, it's a problem for the world, and it's a problem for us. Um, and we need to be dealing with it. Uh, so I, I take the point. Absolutely. Um, you talk about pressure. Um, it was only in April of this year that the Prime Minister wrote this open letter to them and really started to ratchet up both the public and the private pressure. So yes, I would also take the point that that could have happened sooner. Yeah, I'll take that point. Um, but I would argue that we are now trying to step up, um, both internationally and specifically with the overseas territories and the dependent territories, and particularly trying to offer something practical. So as well as just saying, you must do better, you must do better, trying to say, look, and here's a way you can do better. Here's the beneficial ownership uh, initiative. Why don't you start consulting your public? Why don't you start building this coalition that we were just talking about, that I was talking about earlier, and see if we can build some of this pressure to change around some of the drivers for change. I thought your point was, was very well made on uh, how do you create these conditions for pressure and how does that translate into sustained reform? Uh, well, yes, that's an, that's an excellent question. That's a country-specific question. I'd probably also argue it's an issue-specific question. Um, I don't have the answers on, on this issue. I think it's pretty recent. I was interested to hear you've been, uh, Raymond and others have been coming to Brazil for, you said, 25, 15, 25 years, an enormous amount of time. And suddenly we're, we're sensing a very exciting moment here in Brazil on this issue of illicit financial flows. Why is that? I don't know. I think probably we could have 20 different opinions in the room on why that is and how to sustain it. Um, and I think if I bring that back to the UK, um, uh, we're, we're trying, we're at the start of what's going to be quite a long and difficult journey, um, but uh, I, hope, I hope you'll recognize that we're doing it in good faith, at least, even if, it's a, even if there'll be bumps along the road. On the London housing market and pleasing the Russians and the Chinese, well, I've just been reading about how we're not pleasing the Russians in Ukraine uh, and, and various other places. Um, and I think also you can separate investment in a housing market, which I find personally uncomfortable, as I don't have a place in London, and now that's looking uh, increasingly out of my reach. Um, and yeah, so that, yes, absolutely, the housing bubble, how to deal with that, how to deal with the kind of second home phenomenon is mainly Russians uh, rather than Chinese, looking at it as a safe place to invest. Yeah, that's a, that's a significant problem for London real estate. I don't think that's the same. I don't think that means the same as having to please uh, Russian, Chinese, or any other. Uh, foreign or domestic investor in financial markets. I don't think, that, I don't think that's the same thing. Um, I think having an open economy, an open liberal economy, uh, which we believe is the key to both domestic and international economic growth, uh, means that there are going to be foreign investors, that there are going to be uh, skews and distortions in the market, which are going to have to be in some way or other regulated. And where you put that balance is going to change over time, it's going to change over the issue, but I absolutely would separate the real estate market, and, and the problems particularly in London, which I accept, uh, from kind of financial services regulation. Both of you linked uh, issues of, of transparency and, and political will. Transparency is expected to generate the political will to address the kinds of problems that we're, we're talking about. Um, a company that reports no profits here where it's in business and enormous profits over here in a tax haven when it's not in business, where it's not in business, how do you justify that? How do you justify making, uh, showing no profit where you're in business and a lot of profit where you're not in business? You do that with transparency enough and you will motivate civil society and tax collectors and parliamentarians to address that, uh, uh, that kind of problem. So. As I said this morning, there's a large uh, measure of advocacy that we put into our uh, efforts. Uh, let me go a step further in the linkage between transparency and political will. We are trying right now very hard to get included in the post-2015 uh, development goals 
I said this morning, it's called the Millennium Development Goals, the MDCs. <coughs> the next 15 years is usually being referred to as the Sustainable Development Goals. We are trying to get included in the next round of development goals a provision that commits all of us to cut illicit cut illicit financial flows arising from trade misinvoicing by 50% by the year 2030. We're trying to get that in there. We've had good reaction to people that are trying to be specific in the, uh, the next round of development goals, and we've had less favorable reaction from those people who want to be as general as possible in the next round. But we're, we're trying very hard to do exactly that, link these two things, the, requirement, the, the, the measure of transparency and the political will um, uh, to get it uh, in there. Make another comment about how you marshal political will. Civil society organizations, I think, have been very effective, quite effective, in marshalling the political will to address these kinds of problems in the richer countries. We've got the attention of the US and the UK and Germany and France and the Nordic countries and so forth. Politics in the richer countries is more often than not issue politics. In the poorer countries, politics is more often than not identity. And it is somewhat more difficult to, for civil society organizations, advocacy organizations, to have as big an impact in the poorer countries as we have in fact had in uh, the richer countries. It's a longer process. It takes longer in the poorer countries because the nature of politics is different. I hope I'm making uh, sense here. Politics is different. It, it is not possible to take exactly the same kind of motivation of political will that we applied in the richer countries, take that and uh, lock, stock, and barrel and apply it to the poorer countries. It doesn't quite work. You have to have a little bit different approach in the poorer countries because the nature of politics in poorer countries differs than it does in the richer countries. A country like Brazil is sort of in, uh, in, in the middle, where it is influenced by both uh, uh, aspects of this, both issue politics and identity politics. But I, I think the point that I'm, that I'm really trying to convey here is that, repeat what I said earlier, what we're talking about here is not that technically difficult, it's a matter of political will but the political will has to be tailored to um, where it is being applied. You apply it in one way in the richer countries, and you apply it in a different way in the poorer countries. I hope that makes sense. To all oh, it makes sense to me, at, at least. So, uh, any more questions? Okay. <coughs> Good. It's actually two comments, and I, since I have spoken before, I shouldn't take too much time. But I just wanted to to make two points. I mean, one one is that I think it was touched upon in the session we had earlier to some extent, but I think it's important to reiterate actually the point, and that is that currently there is a major problem, and it's linked to fragility of democracy, actually, as Leonardo said in the last session. And it is, you know, when we talk about regulation and that you were talking about the commentator here also that it's about the regulator gaining the upper hand of being able to control the industry. The problem I see currently, however, I mean, you see it in the UK clearly, you see it in Norway as well, everywhere really, is that, I mean, who is it who really influences the international accounting standards, the standard in the financial industry, who is it who is provides most of the substantive inputs in consultation rounds, in change of rules, and also in terms of how what should be ac accepted practice? No doubt, it is the industry itself, and this is linked again to the issue here of democracy. I think here, 
really, I mean, governments and international organizations need to really step up and, and, and make some sort of a new dividing line. I'm not saying, of course, that you should not have consultations, you should not sort of hear from the industry, but clearly there's a crisis there. Really. And, and, and unless that somehow is tackled differently, some sort of, you know, that you construct some sort of, not, not barriers perhaps, but some sort of separation of roles in a better way, we are going to have a huge problem to really change the, the current status of of how to really deal with illicit financial flows and tax evasion and, um, and tax um, avoidance as well. That was the first comment I wanted to make. The second one I think is when we talk about <coughs> a lot of initiatives for increasing transparency, I think we talk about transparency at different levels or certain, or certain I, I would for example talk about EITI sort of a first level, very basic, but nevertheless very important initiative. I worked on EITI throughout Africa and to some extent in Asia as well, so I know it very well. It's very important, it can be hugely powerful, but it has big limitations as well. Second level is a bit this sort of country by country reporting, extended version, um, all, all also perhaps going into the, uh, the automatic exchange or the exchange arrangements. That also will get you to a certain point. Third level, perhaps, that we haven't talked about that much. I think it's happening to some extent. And I want to share with you, because we worked on this from the Norwegian side in a few countries in Africa. It didn't really go anywhere, to be honest, uh, yet. But that is to really put more, much more of the emphasis on the companies. I mean, why are we all the time talking about, you know, we should be able to exchange between governments? Yes, that's important. But why not put the on onus on the company? Why do we give a contract in the petroleum sector, or mining, or a license to operate, uh, you know, without much stricter conditions in terms of documentation rules, in terms of saying that, look, I mean, if, if you get a visit by the tax authority or another branch of the government, these are the documents you are then obliged to provide to us. If we need further documentation to be able to prove the trail of, 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 of this cost you are claiming or this sale you are claiming, it's your responsibility to give it to us within certain time limits. And you could even put punishment linked to it if they don't provide it. Why are we not talking about also putting the onus on the company to provide these things? Instead of saying, well, you know, maybe the government will ask, it might get it or not. It's actually possible to regulate and to make contracts in different ways where you put much more of the emphasis on the companies to provide this. This should become more and more the standard in a different way of organizing society, I think. And I think it can be done. We did draft an example in Tanzania that was presented uh, for political discussion. It has been launched for discussion under the AU as well in the, in the corruption commission there hasn't really gained much traction yet. And uh, unless more countries pick it up and there's more sort of interest in it, I don't think it will happen. But I, it is actually possible to put more of more emphasis on this. There is a social contract to some extent, you know, between if you are a company operating in society. I mean, you, you, get, you get the license to do a lot of things. You should also then comply on your side in a different way than it is today. Thank you. So, any further? I think we're approaching our deadline in terms that we still have our keynote speaker to deliver the keynote speech, right? So, uh, I hope that um, that you learned from this session. I certainly did, and I also hope it was an entertaining one. So, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, our, your wisdom and. I think we should move to the, the, the final uh, part of the story. And I'll hand it to Christy to explain to us what we should do. First, thank you to the panel. Thank you.